Hello and welcome to A Bit of a Christie, the podcast series for fans of Agatha Christie, murder mysteries or true crime. Here we explore the works of Agatha Christie and connect them to historical crime cases which follow a similar plot. I'm Hazel Jones and this is A Bit of a Christie. Welcome to episode two. Today we will discuss Christie's 1934 work, Three Act Tragedy, and explore the realities of life as a modern actor with West End performer and acting coach, Julian Holt. But first, as always, let's look at the world that Christie was writing in. In 1934, While Stanley Matthews made his debut for the England national football team and a photograph of the Loch Ness Monster was published for the first time, there was drama aplenty on the international stage. Notorious criminals Bonnie and Clyde were taken down by the FBI. Adolf Hitler declared himself Führer and absolute leader of Germany and the USSR was admitted to the League of Nations. Well, what an eventful year. As this is an Agatha Christie podcast, it seems only right that we look at the plotline of the book which we are focusing on today. Three Act Tragedy was first published in America in 1934 and it captured the imagination of readers with the mysterious deaths of a vicar, a doctor and a patient at a sanatorium. Who would link these three deaths together and apprehend the protagonist of this murderous plot? Of course, our favourite Belgian detective, Poirot, is persuaded to take on the case. The story of Three Act Tragedy is set in Lumoth in Cornwall. Affluent and famous actor Sir Charles Cartwright has decided to host a party at his home, Crow's Nest. An eclectic mixture of guests have accepted his invitation. Amongst them, our friend Monsieur Poirot, a young lady nicknamed Egg, with her mother Mrs Lytton Gore, and their family friend Oliver Manders. What dinner party would be complete without a vicar? Well, certainly not this one, with Reverend Babington and his wife being asked along. Famous and mysterious playwright Miss Wills also accepted Sir Charles's invitation. Perhaps they know each other from the theatre. Not sufficed with local gentry, a cleric and a writer, our host goes on to invite an ex-military man in Captain Dacre's with his wife Cynthia, his oldest friend Dr Bartholomew Strange and the astute and quiet observer Mr Satterswaite. In fairness, on paper, there should be some interesting conversation to be had. The night is setting in to be another evening of delicious food and entertaining company when disaster strikes during the pre-dinner cocktails. Reverend Babington has literally dropped down dead in the middle of the room after tasting one of the cocktails brought round on a tray. Sir Charles is convinced that this elderly man didn't simply die of natural causes and fears foul play. He pushes for an inquest into the death. However, after the glass is analysed, no poison was found. Surely this was just bad timing and not a murderer as suspected. Like many books published on both sides of the pond, The American title and the British title aren't quite the same. We are using the British title Three Act Tragedy as we are based here, but for any of our American listeners, you may know the book as Murder in Three Acts. Interestingly enough, the difference in titles doesn't stop there, with the Hungarian version having two names. The first, the unthinkable, is Hercule Poirot wrong, and the second, the same as the American title. A little quiz now. What is the title of this book in Germany? Hmm, 
answer at the end of the show. Seeing as our book is called Three Act Tragedy, and one of the main characters, Sir Charles Cartwright, is a famous actor, why don't we go behind the curtain and see what life is really like for a modern-day actor? In today's episode, we welcome West End actor Julian Holt, who, amongst other things, has starred in Alice in Wonderland, Sweeney Todd, Little Shop of Horrors, and The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Let's find out what life for Julian is really like, and whether it's anything like the life of Sir Charles Cartwright. Hello, Julian, and welcome to A Bit of a Christie. Please, would you introduce yourself for our wonderful listeners? My name is Julian Holt. A bit of an introduction um, about myself. I am an actor based in the West Midlands. I have been in various theatre shows over the years, including Mr Beaver in Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company, um, World Arena Tour of Jesus Christ Superstar. I'm also a teacher and I have my own business that really helps working class kids get into drama school. Um, which is my other passion when I'm not uh, not on the stage. I have had brilliant success with that recently um, and it's really exciting to watch these kids break down barriers and gain acceptance to some of the best drama schools in the world. Yes, that's a, bit, a little bit about myself. Well, today, as you know, Julian, we're looking at the Agatha Christie book, Three Act Tragedy, and that focuses on an actor called Sir Charles Cartwright. How did you get into acting? I'm just one of those ones that, um, uh, like many, many before me, had ADHD and what they perceived to be, you know, attention deficit disorder back in the day and all this energy and um, was advised to, my mum was advised to focus and channel that into um performance drama dance so that's what we did you know and I loved it I thrived so that's how I started I, I joined a Saturday theatre school um which is where I learned uh, about discipline time management you know a lot of key skills that you learn um as, as growing up and this is what I say to my parents and the parents of the students I teach it's actually the key skills that you you learn when you're training to become an actor are essential for so many uh, occupations and and day-to-day life really so yeah so i was uh, went to saturday theater school i was there from a very young age um until i was old enough to start auditioning for drama school which i was very lucky i had amazing teachers at this saturday theater school this random saturday theater school in telford shropshire which is where I'm from originally. And uh, they were all working actors as well at the same time, which is great. You know, a lot of our teachers were kind of flitting between West End and coming up and teaching us. So we were very lucky. In the book, Julian, there's a quote, and it's from Poirot himself. And he says, You have the actor's mind, Sir Charles. Creative, original, seeing always dramatic values. Do you believe there is such a thing as the actor's mind? Um, now you've said it like that, potentially, yes, I kind of do. I think, it, on the other hand, you know, I'm terrible at maths. Don't give me algebra. I'm not going to be able to do it. I think we all have certain mindsets and certain things. Um, I'm also rubbish with IT. Don't ask me to do any kind of technical, you know, technology is, is not my strong point. So I actually think there is merit in that kind of having an actor's mindset. They're all kind of key skills that come together to make that, though. In the book, Sir Charles Cartwright carefully um, selects his cast for the cocktail party he's hosting. And he has a wide range of, of people there with all different backgrounds. But in the real world of acting, how does the um, audition process work? Because most of us will go for a job interview and I should imagine it's quite different to the interview for an actor. Usually it comes through your agent. Um, 
However, there w- there might be circumstances where you see that actually on social media that it's been released, um, and you kind of give a wink, wink, nudge, nudge to your agent, send a little email and go, I would very much like to be seen for that. So um, that's usually the process. I've been with my agent for seven years now. My agent is kind of fantastic at, at this point, knowing what I would want to do. There's only a few circumstances where I felt like at that period of time in my life, it wasn't right. And you you do, you as you get older, priorities change. You know, when you first, a first graduate from drama school, I didn't mind doing a year and a half tour around the country. But when you get older and you're settled and you're in your house with your partner and your dog, um, roaming around the country with a suitcase, you know, one week you're in, you know, Skegness, the next week you're in Bradford, isn't really what I want to do anymore. Well, in part two of our interview with Julian Holt, we'll be seeing how he managed to transform into Mr Beaver in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. But now we return to our story, Three Act Tragedy. Do we know whether the vicar really was murdered? Let's find out. We rejoin the story in Monte Carlo, where oddly three of our main characters have found themselves at the same time. The quiet observer with seemingly no first name, Mr Satterswaite, is reading a two-day-old newspaper and discovers that tragically another member of the cocktail party guest list has died. But who was it? The captain? The playwright? No, it's Dr Bartholomew Strange. Remember the oldest friend of Sir Charles Cartwright? By coincidence, just at that moment, Sir Charles appears in front of Mr Satterswaite. The actor is already aware of the news about his friend, and the two men discuss the case and decide to return to England. In the distance, Mr Satterswaite sees the shape of a head he recognises. It's Poirot, who has yet to hear the details of Doctor Strange's death. He agrees that it is a curious matter, that there is now a second death, and wishes Sir Charles and Mr Satterswaite all the best with their investigation. Key facts that the amateur sleuths discover are that Doctor Strange had recently hired a new butler called Ellis, and there was a new patient at the sanatorium called Mrs de Rushbridger. Ellis disappeared without a trace, and it seems as though they are at a dead end when who should arrive to help out but our favourite little Belgian detective. We here at A Bit of a Christie Podcast don't want to reveal the ending to those of you enticed to read this mystery, so we will leave the story there. In Monte Carlo, Poirot had previously remarked, What zeal he has, our Sir Charles. He is determined then to play this role, the role of the amateur policeman. So, this got me thinking. How exactly do you take on a new role and convince the world you're somebody else? Surely there is nobody better to ask than West End actor Julian Holt. We now return to our interview. You have, of course, played a wide range of roles, but most of them are human. What's the process when you have to play a different role, such as Mr Beaver? Um, Yes, so the process is I was very much vocal, even for my audition, what kind of percentage or what kind of mannerisms would I have as the animal and as myself? And so, and, and also I was very much in a partnership. My, um, the person that I was working with, Christina Tedes, was my wife. So we worked on kind of the physicality together um, and we found the right balance, I believe, because we still have to deliver a story. We can't be doing any kind of funny voices, but it was. It was very much, we were told for the audition that it was Faulty Towers meets Dad's Army meets Mr Beaver. So I kind of, before my audition, did my research. And I, of course, knew uh, of of both of those programmes. I've watched those programmes for years. But sometimes you have to go back and watch things with a critical eye and kind of have a look at what, what genre of performance can I take from that you know so certain things come from certain things you know the the dad's army that very kind of clipped way of talking 1940s BBC RP and then Faulty Towers very much the dynamic of the husband and wife and the the husband 
you know, being a bit of the buffoon, that very old school kind of BBC dynamic. How do rehearsals work? Because you were in a pairing with Christina Tedders as Mr and Mrs Beaver. Would you mainly rehearse with her or would you be with the full cast? I think we only had three weeks rehearsal. Um, So you'd have your main rehearsal space and if you had, you know, 30 minutes to grab, um, whether that be a break or, you know, me and Christina would always grab that time together not just with our with our lines, it was with our body language. We really it was a com- it was a comedic double act, and that's all about timing. I think the listeners might be surprised that with the lines, body language, building a relationship and the chemistry with your partner, and the animal characterisation, you only get three weeks. Is three weeks enough? Well, I would say no. But the thing is, you know, other shows, you, I mean, realistically, other shows, you would get longer. You would get five or six weeks, some shows. The RSC are, are fabulous with rehearsal time. You have a lot of rehearsal time with the RSC. But because Line the Witch in the Wardrobe, before it went to West End, was already, it was doing a UK tour. So it was primarily already set up. And most of the cast, there was only me and a girl called Delaney who was playing Lucy, the, out of the kind of main characters that were taking over. Whereas pr- primarily most of the main roles, um, such as like Sam Womack and Chris Jarrett, and um, they'd already done it on tour. Um, so I think that's why they could get away with three weeks rehearsal. Usually, like I said, it'd probably be about five or six. Can it get quite stressful? How do you personally cope with the extra pressure and time restraints? Usually my partner is the best at <laughs> calming me down. Um, but most people go through that. You go through those first few days. There's always a, a way in a rehearsal process. You go for the, the first few days, you think, great, I love this job. I've got this character that I'm really excited about. And then no matter where you are and who you are, self-doubt will always creep in at some point. It will always creep in at some point. Then you go through a week of thinking you're just dreadful. Um, then, and then you kind of build yourself up there. It, it's kind of a typical actor's process of like, yay, this is wonderful. Now I'm really down on myself. And then it's the building, the building of the part and building yourself back up. Has there ever been a time when you've walked away from a role? No, I don't think it's ever got to that stage. I think there's all, it's always been to a stage where, you know, you have a bit of a rant, you have a bit of a cry, you, you kick yourself up the backside and you continue. What would you say the key skills were that an actor needs? To, to, get, this, to get the kind of, um, to the level that you wish to be, it takes dedication uh, time. You know, uh, when I teach, I have an hour a week with a lot of these students. Now, I can advise you what to do, give you the groundwork to do it, but you've got to have the discipline and dedication to go and do that work outside of class, you know. Um, it, it's really funny because I, I would say those are the two most important things, actually. And yes, of course, having talent is really important. It's Of course it is. Um, but I've seen I've seen very talented pupils kind of stagnate and stay the same level, whereas I've seen students that want it and put that work ethic into it, and you just see them really, really improve and sometimes overtake the students that are more naturally gifted. So it is a mixture of things, you know, being good at you've got to be. Um, on the front foot with acting. You've got to always be thinking um, what's next. I think what's always good is that from a young age, we're kind of, uh, improvisation is kind of the first introduction to acting usually, which is great because you have to think on your feet. You have to change, you have to be open to change. So a lot of the skills that you need to be an actor is always kind of being drilled into you from a young age. I'm not too familiar with the acting world myself and I don't know much of the language, but I have heard the phrase um, triple threat. 
Is it really important to be able to sing and dance as well as act? Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. This is why we have um, we have what they deem as straight acting courses for some reason. And then you have musical theatre courses. Um, some courses um, still have, uh, they're an acting course that have singing. A lot of these big, these big name schools, Lambda, Central, um, I believe, you know, Guildhall, I think you have to sing for most of them. What they're looking for is not the best singer in the world. They're not looking for that. What they're looking for is you're taking a song as, as almost a monologue with notes. I've seen many a, a, a beautiful singer, but they don't connect to the words. And that, for me, is the most important thing. I would suggest that you have to be comfortable enough that you can perform a song in front of a panel. One of the best musical theatre performances is actually Judy Dench singing Send in the Clowns. Now, Judy has got a, a lovely singing voice, but what makes it phenomenal is her acting through song. That's what's incredible. It, you know, it makes it magical. Um, so I always, I always show my students who are not confident with singing but love acting, I always show them that performance, actually. Have you ever found it difficult to leave a character behind? For example, switching between your life and the character's life, which I would think most times would be incredibly different. I'm not a fan of method acting. I don't think it's healthy. I believe in a process called emotional recall. But even then, I feel like I feel like with emotional recall, you have to be really safe with how you use that. I yes, yeah, so I don't. I'm not a huge fan of method acting. Um, however, with emotional recall, um, with my students, it, when we do it, we will always kind of take it to that space and then kind of think technically. Okay, what did that do to you? As in respect of like, how did it make you physically feel? As the book we're looking at today is Three Act Tragedy, we thought we would turn Julian's interview into three sections. And the final act, if you will, of that interview is coming up shortly. In every episode, we try to find a true crime case which has echoes of the plot for the book that we're looking at in that particular episode. We try to get it as close to the publication year as possible. Today we're going to look at the horrifying murder of a vicar in 1936. Was the case ever solved? Let's find out. The case that we're looking at today took place in Melbourne, Australia, on Thursday the 12th of December 1935. Reports from the Lithgow Mercury, the local paper, stated that the Reverend Harold Laceby Cecil, vicar of St Andrews, Fitzroy, Melbourne, was battered to death in his study. It is believed that he disturbed a burglar and was killed in a fierce struggle with the intruder. The newspaper goes on to detail how the Reverend was of late quite concerned with the idea that he may be burgled. And he had in fact had trees and shrubs removed from his large front garden so that they would not provide a hiding place for the intruders. A search for the house and grounds had failed to reveal the suspected murder weapon of an iron bar, which again is believed to have belonged to the Reverend himself. It was thought that he kept this in his bedside cabinet, just in case an intruder came. The last line of the article states that the murderer left little behind that might prove of assistance to the detectives. So, was this crime, this murder of a reverend in his own vicarage, ever solved? Let's have a look through the archives to find out. Another paper, called The Age, attempted to shine a little bit more light on the motive behind the attack. Although it was discovered that drawers had been ransacked in the vicarage, it was thought that this might have been a blind, and actually he may have been murdered by a man who had a grudge against him. It was discovered in the investigation that the Reverend had been annoyed with hoodlums getting into the grounds of the vicarage, and the week before he was murdered, he was continually worried about an intruder possibly breaking in. 
Another theory was that due to the crime taking place in December, that the Reverend may have been holding funds for a Christmas charity in the property. And whilst he didn't normally have money in the house, this was the perfect opportunity to find some treasure. The Reverend was a keen musician and sadly had been the victim of robbery before when burglars had broken into his house and taken some of his instruments. Three days after his body was discovered, Reverend Harold Laceby Cecil's body was carried into his Church of St Saviour's for a memorial service. The Daily Examiner noted that there were 16 choir girls, an archbishop, 67 Anglican clergymen and over a thousand people lining the road leading up to the church. However, whilst the Reverend Laceby Cecil was being laid to rest, the Australian police were investigating further claims that two men had been seen near his home on the Thursday morning of which he died. There had also been fingerprint evidence found. Christmas came and went, and with it arrived 1936, alongside some interesting, happy and sad news on Australian radio. Took the Murray River up to its highest level for six years, and all over the great state of the Commonwealth, they are sending reports of waters at flood height and still rising. Australia gives us news of the new season's crop of koala bears, the cute little fellows who live in the trees near Sydney. If mother is out of sight, the baby will follow anything that moves. But first, Charlie and Willie have to have their climbing. This was the year where the three Australian boys were entertaining crowds, and it was also the year in which the murderer of Reverend Laceby Cecil was finally found. Young man arrested. Charge of murder laid. Early yesterday, several members of the Criminal Investigation Branch, led by Detective Sergeant Carey, paid a visit in a police motor car to certain suburbs including East Melbourne. After calling at the house in East Melbourne, they returned to the city, accompanied by a man whom they had interviewed in the course of their morning inquiry. Trial of accused. Alleged statement tendered. Melbourne, Tuesday. Edward Cornelius, 29, motor mechanic, appeared in the criminal court today, charged with having murdered the Reverend Harold Laceby Cecil, vicar of St Saviour's Anglican Church, Collingwood. Cornelius pleaded not guilty. Mr J. L. Long, who appeared for Cornelius, submitted that a statement alleged to have been made by the accused to the police should not be admitted as evidence, because Cornelius had been induced to make the statement when the detectives who questioned him threatened that, unless he did so, Edna Wall, a young woman who had been found in Cornelius's room, would be charged with the murder of the vicar. Mr Long alleged that the detectives had obtained specimens of the accused handwriting by trickery. Mr Justice Martin ruled that the statement was admissible. The Crown Prosecutor... Mr Brook, KC, read a statement alleged to have been made and signed by Cornelius. In the alleged statement, Cornelius said that he'd heard that there was a considerable sum of money in the vicarage. He called there about 8.30 on the morning of December the 12th. The vicar opened the door. Cornelius, according to the statement, asked the vicar to arrange for a wedding. He was carrying some tools, including a spanner. Cornelius signed a card with the name of Francis Edward Loyne. Cornelius then left the vicarage by the front door, but returned without the knowledge of the vicar and began to go through the study desk. Someone seized him from behind. There was a struggle. Cornelius picked up the spanner, which was wrapped in the brown paper, and struck the other person on the head several times. Then he realised that it was the vicar. The vicar had fallen to the ground. Cornelius went to the front door to close it. While he did so, the vicar followed him and seized him again. Cornelius struck the vicar several times on the head. The alleged statement said that Cornelius took about eight pounds from the vicar's pockets. He also took a gold watch and a silver watch and a chain. Mary Allen Hart of Pran, wife of a second-hand dealer, identified Cornelius as the man to whom her husband had sold a spanner for nine shillings on February the 12th, 
the hearing was adjourned. The trial of Edward Cornelius began on the 24th of March 1936 in the Melbourne Criminal Court. However, just three days later, Justice Martin sentenced him to death. He was hung at Pentridge Prison at 8 o'clock in the morning on the 22nd of June 1936. He seemed calm just before his death and when asked if he had anything to say, he said, nothing, I'm right. So there we have it. Two murdered vicars, one fictional and one sadly very real. Was Edward Cornelius taking on the role of an innocent man to avoid punishment for the crime? Perhaps being a murderer requires you to channel some of your inner actor, rehearsing lines and pretending to be something you're not. We return to our guest Julian Holt, who can shed some light on whether anybody can be trained to be an actor and whether you really need to be able to sing, dance and act to be a success. We've previously discussed how you got into the character of Mr Beaver, but that was quite a different character to play. How do you go about researching your other roles? You know, regarding character research, even in English you hear about the five Ws, who, what, where, why, when. So I would very much always start with with those kind of basic questions. You know, I get the script, I have a look at who my character is, and also what's really important is the world of the play. You know, um, especially if you get a classic play and you are setting it in the 16th century in in Venice, then what was the what was the time period like? What would what would you have worn? You know, would it have been like would it have been hot and sweaty and would you have been drinking ale for most of you, you know? You can kind of look at different things in the respect of um, life and death stakes, for instance, you know, say 16th century. Um, I'm 36 now. I'd almost certainly be on the way out as a 36 year old. I would have been, you know, a few more years and I would have been exceptionally old. So you've got to kind of think of the world of the play. I think that's really important to me. And the, and so research is integral for me as an actor. You know, I even love, there's a programme that's called Super Sizes Go, and it has Sue Perkins in, who I adore. It was a fantastic TV programme that that showed you what you'd be eating on a, on a weekly basis. And for me, it's, it's so interesting. Animal studies was a big thing at my drama school. So, for instance, I know, um, you know, especially if I am in a show where I'm jumping from character to character to character, I will do all that research, obviously, for each character. Um, And sometimes if you've got a, a character that isn't really written, then the creativity comes and you can put your own stamp on it. Um, But also I use animal studies in that. So automatically, um, you know, I would think, oh, this character gives me the character of a dog. Bizarre, but it automatically would change your physicality, the way you moved, the way you talked, the way you would even gesture, move your head, move your eyes. Um, Especially if I've got, which has happened where I've been in a show where I'm playing several smaller parts. It helps you kind of differentiate between the roles. And at the time at drama school, I was thinking, why am I doing this? Why am I pretending to be a mere cat for a week? Why am I why am I at the back of Hampstead Theatre in Swiss Cottage, London, being a panda bear? Um, you know, so you do you do some wacky stuff at drama school. And when you're younger, you think, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? But actually, as I've got the few years into the business and I've got a bit older. There's certain things that I go, that's why they wanted us to do that. How important is an accent to a character's development? The voice is is a strange one because sometimes you can get wrapped up in it and it doesn't help, you know. Sometimes the voice can come from doing the character for a bit and physically finding the voice. And I know that sounds weird, but, you know, like I said with Mr Beaver... Um, you know, that very clipped British RP 1940s 
uh, came from those visuals that I was given, but also from the way I moved. So they kind of marry each other. A lot of the time you're kind of already assigned what what accent you need to do. And then you have to obviously work on that and and perfect it as much as possible. You know, uh, you know, I'm a stickler for accents. I I find it because I'm from West Midlands and um, a lot of people think they can do a really good West Midlands accent. But actually, they really can't. In the book, uh, Three Act Tragedy, we obviously have an actor, but we also have the playwright, Miss Wills. Is there any other aspect of drama and theatre that you have an interest in? Definitely directing. Definitely directing. And, And up until starting teaching, I've never had that kind of opportunity. Then obviously, when you become... A, a teacher at kind of a Saturday theatre school, um, you kind of have to become all of those things at once, don't you? You have to become the director. And we were doing um, we were doing scenes from The Crucible, which I had to direct. And I really found that I just really enjoyed it. In the book, Sir Charles Cartwright has changed his name to a stage name. Presumably, Mr Mugg wouldn't have worked as well on the posters. Um, are stage names still a thing? Yeah, of course, absolutely. And actually, uh, one of my childhood friends, um, Amy Clark, had to change her name because there was, an, there was another Amy Clark. Um, and she changed her name to Amy Christie. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, so she might kill me for saying that, but she did. She changed it to Christie because she loves, you know, I remember um, going to her house and very much, you know, Death on the Nile, uh, Murder on the Orient Express. She loved all of those films. Going back to stage names, um, I kept my name. You know, it's it's one of those things. It still happens to the day that, to this day that uh, people change their stage names. Usually, their surname. The ninety nine point nine percent of the time, you wouldn't change your first name. You change your surname still. As well as a very talented actor, you are an acting coach. How did that come about? Coaching started because of the pandemic. You know, it was it was lots of lots of jobs fell through. We had two years of no theatre, which is my bread and butter. It's what I, you know, pay my mortgage with. So I think um, I, I just thought, right, OK, let's do some online teaching. Um, because where I'm from, there really wasn't anything like this that I deliver. Um, I was finding that more and more, especially children from working class backgrounds, they didn't have um, the preparation they needed to gain access to these schools. And therefore, we're missing out on this amazing working class talent that's always been there. One of my recent students um, who I, you know, I spotted working at a Saturday theatre school myself um, had all this potential, um, but didn't have you know what they needed to do to gain access to this course because you don't just audition for drama schools overnight there's preparation needed there's understanding of classical text there's process needed there's um building up interview techniques um and he um has just started at uh, lambda which is one of the best drama schools in the world um so it's been really interesting and really re- rewarding doing the coaching as well as the acting Thank you so much, Julian, for coming on to the show today. It's been brilliant to hear about the coaching process and your work and experiences as an actor. Obviously, here at A Bit of a Christie, we want to praise and promote anybody that we can. So how can people get in contact with you or follow your career? If you want to have a look at my coaching, I have a Facebook page, which is Julian Holt, um, acting coach for Wolverhampton. Um, for, for teaching work, then regarding acting work, I'm with an agency called uh, the BWH Agency, which is based in London. Um, so you can have a look at all my information on their website. So, yeah, so that's basically the main places where you can kind of contact me, either for coaching work or for acting work. I do have Twitter, uh, which is at Julian Holt. Very simple, very easy. I also have Instagram, which is also at Julian Holt, but I'm relatively new to Instagram. I only uh, started Instagram because, quite frankly, I I didn't really see the point of it. Um, Having said that, since I've got it, I've thoroughly enjoyed having it. So there you go. Well, that brings us to the end of another episode. We would like to thank Julian Holt for being such a fabulous guest. Agatha Christie for writing such engaging novels and also pay tribute to Reverend Laceby Cecil 
who was described as a man who was very much admired in his community. We return next time with the story of the pale horse and an interview with the practising witch, Jade M. Lauren. Tune in to find out how you could be partaking in witchcraft if you stir your cup of tea in the morning, and also Jade's view on the apology from the Scottish Government for the witch trials. Oh, and in case you thought we'd forgotten, the name of the book in Germany? Nicotine, which of course is the murder weapon. I wonder how many of you got that. See you next time on A Bit of a Christie.